Hello movie lovers, it's Nick here speaking to you for Critical Hit Entertainment and this evening we're very fortunate enough to actually have an interview with a real life director. Uh, his name is Mark Murphy, he lives in England and he's just finished um, filming and he actually wrote as well a movie called The Revenger, a unromantic comedy. And it's a real director, I promise you, it's not some bloke I met down the pub. I have tried it a couple of times, bottle of whiskey, put a hat on, looks like a director. This guy's actually the real deal. He's made a couple of movies before, excuse me, um, the last one being The Awaiting, Awaiting, sorry, uh, with Tony Curran, and that came out a year or two ago. I also managed to interview him then too. Uh, this time we actually have a video of him, so thank you very much, Mark. I really do appreciate the time um, to meet up with me and, and chat about your movie. We also have a interview or a answer, sort of question answer session somewhere on the page either below or above not quite sure what the spacing is going to be from Rob Kaczynski now he plays this guy I'm not going to go into too much detail we'll let Mark do the talking about that he plays a guy who decides to get his own back on his fiance when he finds out that she's kind of after le less more you know less love and more ching ching make it rain so before um we get there um, I just want to quickly say uh, I really enjoyed this movie I had a great time it's a very British movie uh, very much like Four Weddings and a Funeral, uh, that sort of warm kind of feeling that you get. That being said, it's a very unconventional movie as far as rom-coms. It's not going to be a 10 things I hate about you kind of thing where you know exactly where it's going. In fact, you're going to guess, what, 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 where, where are we going with this? And I think that's one of the great things too um, about it. So anyway, without further ado, let's go straight through to Mark and the first question. Hi, I'm Mark Murphy. I'm the writer-director of The Revenger, an unromantic comedy, and I'm here talking to you on criticalhit.net. Um, it's a rather cynical take, obviously, on the British rom-com. How did you walk that, that narrow line between becoming something that could be quite dark um, and, and something that would be a lot fluffier? Uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky one, because you know what? It's, it's started off as an unromantic comedy, like, but basically it is romantic. Hmm. I mean, the whole crux of it is, it's supposed to be the antithesis of a romantic comedy. But there I say, it, I think it's actually a really good romantic comedy. As you say, it's got loads of heart and, and everything. And it, so originally it was, um, it was intended to be like a romantic comedy for lads. And I still think it applies to that. But it's it's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a Gemini film. It has these two kind of characteristics, these two kind of personalities. One is this distinctly unromantic feel, <laughs> but on the other hand, it's also incredibly romantic. It's a, it's a weird dichotomy, um, and that sort of came about by organic happy coincidence. I mean. Okay. We had this story, and originally it was just a very unromantic comedy. I'm not going to say too much about the end, because obviously, when you watched it, did it end the way you expect, expected it to? No. Um, that's one of the reasons <clears throat> why I liked it so much, actually. That's one of the reasons it was different to the Four Weddings and a Funeral formula. Yeah, and originally we did have an ending exactly how you'd expect it to end. Okay. And it's tricky for me, and I've done this in the past with you before, where I've destroyed the ending. And it's okay, I'll edit that out anyway. I'll, edit that. Will be, I'll have a spoiler version and I'll have a non-spoiler version, but um, yeah, I won't, I'm not, not going to give spoilers. <laughs> yeah. um, unfortunately, I've got no sort of girlfriends or ex-girlfriends sitting near me who, who, who can't be protected by your you know, redacted version. But, uh, <laughs> just, um, but yeah, it's um, originally we had it written whereby, yeah, it happened exactly as you, you'd expect it to. And, and, and my kind of way of working is this. I do 25 drafts of the script. Until we start filming, there's always opportunities to find something new, to create something better. And especially as the week before filming, I'll be rehearsing with the actors. Um, and, you know, when you get, and especially in this, I mean, the actors in this, let's, let's be totally frank, they're awesome. They're really strong. Awesome people, right there. Very, very good cool people, yeah. Um, and that's not, I'm not trying to blow smoke up anyone's arse here, because, you know, I have worked with some good actors in the past. I've worked with some awful actors in the past. But, you know, this is such a stellar team, mm. and such a pivotal reason why the film, in my opinion, works as, as well as it does. So when you start getting actors getting under the skin of the characters, you start finding more jokes. You start finding 
nuances that you'd never have thought of. I'm sort of suggesting that that's where this ending came back. It didn't. It actually came before. But going back to my point, I'm always working on. You know, I don't get to a point and say, right, that's it. There's, it's 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 literally until we finish editing, then that's the story. You know, locked off. There's always a way of doing. It. In particular, one of the processes is I don't want to give an ending that is expected. I was canning myself laughing. That one particular scene with the bloody trousers? Oh, my goodness. And I'm, I'm really glad you're saying that because that's the scene that worried me the most. I mean, okay, so in the end credits, it's not, it's not a Marvel bonus. It was originally going to be like a Marvel bonus type thing, you know, where you end credits roll and you see that scene of Tim and, Tim and Ed. Uh, not, not Tim and Ed, Tim and um, Mark. Um, or Tim and, yeah, Tim and Mark. Sorry, I, I get really uh, screwed up with actors' names and characters' names. Like, I'm sure it's mishmash right now. Uh, but um, there's that scene in the end credits which originally took place after Mark finds out, you know, and he gets the phone and he realizes that it's all a scam. <laughs> uh, and I thought this is a hilarious scene. You know, there's Tony Way and Rob Kaczynski. I loved it. Where... I have to say, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> And, and it was, it's, I just loved it, and Rob's performance, it was almost Jim carrey mm, you know, mm. like, it was just, and then, when we did a chess screening, people hated it. What? They, wow. they, they wow. didn't think it was unfunny, they just thought it was misplaced, they were like, hang on, we've gone from this kind of a film, to this kind of a film, it's a completely different brand of mm, mm. performance, of comedy, it's, it stood out like a sore thumb, so I'm like, Okay, uh, and I sent. I, I, I did the thing that I don't usually do, but I've, I've got a really good relationship with Rob, and you know, I think we trust each other quite a lot. Um, and I showed it to him. Uh, he's over in LA, and he's obviously got some wonderful connections over there. He's, you know, Pacific Rim and Warcraft and all the rest. He knows a lot of people, and people love him over there. They really do. Um, and so I knew he was going to be able to show a few people and get some professional feedback from, you know, people of, uh, you know, quite a respectable you know amount of experience and um, you know he was sitting there and the feedback he got and these are from like big time editors as well was you gotta lose that scene yeah. and he he's, he was against it as well he's like what um, and in the end he capitulated and he was like okay fair enough you made a fairly good point that scene's gotta go and he told me that and I'm like yeah we just had a test screening same response so I took it out now that scene flows so much better, better because originally that scene was just you get this revelation suddenly it's broken up where he basically says to the audience this is what I'm going to do because the scene was a lot longer mm. um, he goes this is what I'm going to do and then he starts doing it and it's just too much of a, you know, of a flag it's too much of a hey everyone now uh, we're doing this yeah and it was like instead of doing that we just went straight into it and it just flowed so much better mm. but I thought I love that scene so much. I don't want to lose it completely, so I thought I'd put it in the end credits as like a bonus. Is to work with LA. I mean, it is the mecca of our industry. It is, it is the the heart of the the system. They make films that get exploited around the world. You know, that people get to see. And yeah, there's the occasional British film that does that. But there aren't that many. I mean, how many films a year, British, like 100% British made? Because a lot of them, you may say, Bond. But that's not a British film, that's Sony now. Mm. You know, that's, that's American money. You may say um, any working title film. But again, that's universal, I think. You know, it's, it's, it's always American money in there. Um, but a fully fledged British film, something that might be a film for, that really gets pushed around the world. Maybe one or two a year, you know, you know, like a train spotting or something. There aren't that many. Um, there's such a lot of competition here, so aggressive that even if you, you know, and I'm not saying you need big two hundred million dollar budgets to make a good film. You really don't, and sometimes that's, you know, counterproductive. But you know, if you want to make a film that's really gonna get a lot of uh, recognition and an opportunity to be pushed around the world. You do need to spend more than twenty million. You do need to spend more than thirty million, and that's still, by American standards, a low-budget film. You know, um, my goal. Yeah, of course, I want to work in America. I mean, they understand film better than anyone else does. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm not 
you know, very au fait with Indian or Chinese cinema enough to probably make that, you know, that, that broad blanket sort of statement. But, um, but the, in my opinion, you know, America is where it is. And I, I was over in LA, uh, last, yeah, I can say last year now, yeah, uh, over in September a few months ago. And, um, you know, I did, I did meet up with, you know, various people over there and I am getting those wheels turning. Uh, and of course it, it doesn't come down to whether I'm a nice guy or what, you know, how how compelling my argument may be for them taking me on. It's about how well this film is going to do. Um, and, and that's this sort of critical position we're in at the moment. I think the audience will respond to it, but I think the key thing is they need to be able to find it and they need to know about it, and that's about getting good distribution and getting it out. Based on us doing that, based on us getting, you know, a film that does well, because I think... I think critics are going to warm to it. I don't think we're going to suddenly find a wave of animosity and, and um, you know, vile comments saying that, you know, Mark Murphy's done an even worse film this time. Um, well, I'm hoping... I don't think that'll be the case. <laughs> it's not going to be a DC'd um, movie. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, it's. I'm hoping it's going to do well. And if it does, then, yeah, I... I, I the game plan is to start working more in collaboration with LA and, and actually um, through this film, I mean, I, I, I loved working with all the cast there, but I really, really enjoyed working with Rob and, and we, we get on tremendously and, and our plan now is we're, we're opening a, a film company together Oh wow! and we're doing stuff together and I'm hoping that's going to sort of bridge that, that gulf between hmm. London and LA where we can uh, start doing more sort of international productions, or at least if we're shooting in the UK, have American distribution already, uh, in, you know, involved. Have have you know his his agency and his management getting behind the project. So that's what we're doing now. That's what's your question, wasn't it? You had a question about sequels. Well, yeah, I mean, originally. Before we started filming, I always had a trilogy in mind. Oh, wow, uh, so really? First film is about uh, you know Mark and Ken, uh, sorry, Mark and Connie. Um, the second film would be about Tim and how he spends his money. <laughs> uh, um, and Sam Barks came up with a tremendous idea. I probably shouldn't credit her this because she may come back well. later. <laughs> uh, but it was why didn't you start off with Ducky's funeral? Um, so. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I think, the, you know, one of the standout stars of the film is Ducky, and I'm hoping by having a dog in it, um, which my mum pointed out, was just over Christmas, I went down to uh, see my parents in Cornwall, and, uh, you know, the local, Corn I'm not going to say anything derogatory, because it's still a market, uh, the local Cornish, uh, a local Cornish person, obviously my parents lived down there for a while, and, and one of them, you know, they know, everyone knows each other, they all sleep with each other, and, uh, <laughs> and sort of said, oh, you know, have you got any uh, new films coming out, and I said, yeah, I've got one coming out in uh, in a few months, and she goes, oh, has it got anyone famous in it, and my mum goes, it's got a dog, you know, it's <laughs> 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 a dog, the people that cost a lot of money. <laughs> she just filled it with dogs. Apparently, that's all uh, anyone really uh, has any interest in. But people, do. people um, do like a dog. That's true. And I think Ducky's a great, uh, great character, in it, or uh, you know, ably performed by um, uh, Ernie. His name was. That's the nice thing. I mean, I read a couple of articles too about the chemistry, and I spoke to you um, a year ago, even more so. No, no, about a year ago, um, and you said that the, the cast got on very, very well together, and you could see that. I think um, actually on the screen, um, I think I, yeah. it was Samantha. I think Samantha made a comment about everyone being very friendly um, and sort of open on on stage. That, that must lend, of course, itself to the you know occasional spontaneity that looks real and it doesn't appear shoehorned in there. Yeah. Um... Yeah, no, there was, I think there was a de genuine chemistry that the cast. I mean, I don't think they're sort of running off at night all together and, and partying without me, but at least I hope not. But, uh, yeah, no, they all, they all got on. It was it was a fairly relaxed, well, it wasn't a relaxed set. There never is, but it was a, it was, it was a good harmony. Um, and I think that sort of comes through 
in a sense. Uh, or they're just all great actors who hate to get <laughs> I think a bit of both. Um, we'll go with a bit of both um, over there. I mean, Tony, yeah. he was hysterical too. I mean, I think he has some of the best shots as well. I mean, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to ruin it, but that scene at the end with the light shining from behind him, I was yeah. crying <laughs> with laughter. I, I can only imagine how much everyone else on set was crying too, but it's definitely worth uh, watching. <laughs> Again, that post-credit sequence when he's he's having the dance that was originally in the the bulk of the film. Then it's like, okay, now this is just a little too left. Yes, yes. I on I can't lose it. But what a great, you know, put it in there at the ending um, on the credits. Then it sort of fits there, and and it's just you know an opportunity to put one more smile back on the faces um, of the audience. But yeah, no, Tony's terrific. I mean, Tony's, you know, he's, he he writes comedy as well. Mm. He's He's, he's, you know, he's got a big comedy background. He really does. And I've, I've, I've liked him in, you know, so many of the things he's done, but I think this is, this is his crowning moment. And I, I don't want to take anything away from anything else he's done, but this is, he is just unbelievable in it. It's the start of the new year. What was your movie of 2017? <laughs> yeah, I often think that, and part of the problem is I, I keep forgetting what I've seen. Um, I actually genuinely liked Thor 3, uh, Thor Ragnarok. I, I hated the first two. I'm putting myself out there to Kevin Peavy, you know, the <laughs> and say, look, let me do a better job than all these, these terrible films you keep making. Actually, I do like the, the Marvel films. I just don't like, didn't like the first two Thors. He was. Yeah, I, I loved it. He was. It was fantastic. I enjoyed it too. So damn good. I mean, I love Hunt for the Wild People. I love what we do in the shadows, and I thought, you know, the humor in Ragnarok was great. And there was, you know, the action and the story. And I loved his kind of '80s styling, that kind of arcade '80s feel about it. Um, I thought that was terrific. I and mean, that's definitely not my film of the year. Um, but I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I Force Awakens. Ugh. No, that was the airport. Uh, Last, Last Jedi. Jedi. So, nah, again, Kathleen Kennedy. I'm. I know you're giving it back to J.J. Uh, Abrams, and you know what? I think he did a superb job with the Star Trek reboots, but Force Awakens. Sorry. Um, so I'm up for that. It's uh, not it, Johnson. It, it, not convinced with this. I mean, I thought it was better than Force Awakens, but I didn't. I didn't feel it. You know, it's like Star Wars was supposed to be out supposed to be about hope and that's what made uh, Rogue One such a great film especially the ending mm. um, if you can go okay let's say in 10 15 years time okay let's say you're on the level of you know Peter Jackson out there or Steven Spielberg would you ever go back and revisit and redo one of your movies if you thought you could do it better or would you no, leave it alone I mean, life is short. I mean, I, I, I had dreams of being a film director when I was a kid. And, you know, my initial dream was by 26, I'd have won my first Oscar. But that being said, when I went to film school, I thought I'd probably be the camera operator on the first Star Wars, you know, Phantom Menace. Then I'd be DP on the second. I'd probably direct the third. That was a genuine thought I had. I genuinely thought that's probable. Um, and then, you know, reality slapped me in the face. I realized, shit, no, it doesn't work that way. I have so many films I'd love to make. And there's definitely not enough time to, to get in, you know, as many made as you'd like to. Certainly wouldn't waste my time. If, you know, if I didn't do them well enough the first time, then, uh, that, then you know, they, they, I need to leave them there. One sentence, why should people go watch this movie? Um, because it is a really endearing character-led funny story that you're not going to have a clear idea of what's going to happen five minutes later. So you're going to be utterly engaged. You're going to come out with a smile on your face. And films like this need to uh, find their way back into the cinema. Why should you say it? Because you'll enjoy it. Basically, I, 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 I challenge anyone to go and see this film and not enjoy it. I think people really will.